On Nationwide this evening, the generation's old story of Irishmen joining the British Army. We know of their sacrifice in World War I, then of their brave service in the Second World War. But it all goes back much farther than that and indeed continues today. This evening, a special report on the Irishmen who joined the most famous Irish regiment in the British Army. This evening we're coming to you from the port of Dunleary in County Dublin and we're here because there's a long tradition of Irish men from north and south leaving from this port to travel to England to join the British Army. Now last month we were commemorating the soldiers from the island of Ireland who gave their lives in the First World War. But that tradition of Irish men enlisting and serving in the British Army continued right through to the Second World War and even continues today. Most of the Irish men who join up join the Irish Guards. And this evening, Tommy Gorman brings us a special report on that most Irish regiment of the British Army. The portrait on the wall is of Michael Collins, one of the most difficult foes faced by the British during their 800-year turbulent relationship with Ireland. But the image of the big fella hangs proudly on the wall of a British Army barracks outside London. This base at Aldershot is home to the Irish Guards, a unique regiment in the British Army. The Guards are an example of the complex relationship between Ireland and its nearest neighbour. These men are part of a tradition that dates back to the year 1900. It was then that Queen Victoria gave permission to form a new regiment, the Irish Guards, after what were described as courageous actions by Irish soldiers during the Boer War. From early days, the Guards were known as the Mix, and the name has stuck. During World War I, the Irish Guards lost 2,300 men and 5,000 more were wounded. In World War II, 700 Irish Guards were killed and double that number were wounded. Through the generations, the Guards recruited from Ireland, North and South. In working class towns and communities, there's a long tradition of young men joining regiments of the British Army such as the Irish Guards. It was a wage and a job. That pattern continues today. I'd applied originally or initially to join the Irish Army or the Irish Defence Forces as they are now. Um, and I was told that they were, they were fully manned at the time and there was a three year waiting list or there was a backlog of people uh, wait, waiting who had applied. So I was 18 at the time and uh, the economic situation in Ireland at the time wasn't, wasn't great. And uh, to be honest, I just wanted to be, I just wanted to be a soldier. I had an uncle who served in the in, in this regiment in the Irish Guards, and he was my link into into basically opening up another opportunity to to go elsewhere in the army. I was born in Galway, obviously. We lived in Clifton there until I was about five. And then my dad moved down to Kilrush as he took over the boat yard there, and uh, we lived there then until I obviously joined the army there three years ago. And uh, I was going to school there, and obviously it was good, like, and everything was as as you you expect, like good life there and all that. But I wanted to do something else like see the world in that so I decided to come for the Irish Guards over here. Like. I was in the FCA for nine years before I joined uh, the Irish Guards and uh, my CS at the time um, used to tell me all his stories from the time he was in Aiton and that and uh, I took all that in after a few years and I, I got into a bit of a rut myself back at home I was an electrician uh, by trade and uh, there was no work in the building industry in the mid 80s and all that so by the late 80s I decided, yep, that's me, I'm going to go for it. So um, I went up the, the north to uh, Hollywood and took the Queen Shillam. Originally I was in the FCA and um, for a few years in Dublin, so I actually put myself down for the Irish Defence Force, the PDF. Uh, unfortunately they weren't recruiting. So actually a friend of mine looked at a newspaper ad and when the, Irish, uh, news, when the English newspapers would get circulated every Sunday. So you, put, you actually put in for um, got a response back, travelled up a few times to Palace Barracks in Northern Ireland 
and went from there. Number ones, number twos, out behind the weapons, go! At present there are almost 600 soldiers in the Irish Guards. Although females work with it on an attachment basis, it's an all-male regiment. More than 40% of the current force comes from the island of Ireland. At the Aldershot barracks, Irish men from different traditions work and live side by side. We were on a tour of Iraq uh, there last November. Uh, and of course, uh, being a, a regiment, we recruit from the north and the south of the border, Protestant and Catholic, and we all get along extremely well. But there's this great banter, of course, goes on. Uh, all good fun. And this particular time when there was a lot of uh, indirect fire coming in, uh, it's just a note to my colleagues all around me who were Roman Catholics. I said, listen, lads, you know, hopefully they'll be able to identify the bodies so we get a direct hit because I don't want to be buried, buried as a, a Catholic, as it were. So anyway, that was that sort of started a bit of banter going. And uh, they, uh, they approached me a couple of mornings after that and said, nah, Paddy, have you got a sore head? And I'm saying, lads, what, what are you talking about there? What they'd done, actually, they put a set of rosary beads underneath my pillow and I got a great crack of sort of taking the mickey out of me. Most of the lads from Southern Ireland, obviously, uh, they, they'll support teams like Liverpool, Manchester United and Celtic and that. And we all keep our I identity, like most of us will have tricolours, keep our Irish music going, have the crack on St. Patrick's Day and all that. After that, they sort of said, well, you know, you'll have to come along to Lourdes. Great military pilgrimage. There's about 30,000 uh, troops go to Lourdes for that particular weekend. And indeed, there's about uh, over 1,000... Uh, soldiers from the Irish Republic. So they coaxed me into this trip to Lourdes uh, and there I was abroad from the Shankill in Lourdes enjoying the great crack. Ben Farrell is the officer commanding, the person in overall charge of the Irish Guards. As his name suggests, he has Irish roots. Generations back, the Farrells lived in County Down before they emigrated and settled in the Scottish borders. Ben Farrell was educated by the Jesuits at Stonyhurst. There's a tradition of Irish Guards officers coming from those British public schools with a Catholic ethos, like Ampleforth, Downside and Stonyhurst. It has really been a lifelong dream of mine since I was a boy, since my aspirations were to join the Irish Guards and I find myself as a commanding officer of, in the region of 650-700 men, all of whom are dedicated and committed to being utterly professional in what they do and uh, serving Queen and Country and really being a part of a special organisation. So I find myself in an immensely privileged position. Alongside his computer, Ben Farrell has a mouse mat, a gift from the Irish Defence Forces. And when Ireland play England, say in rugby or in football, what happens here? Uh, I'm slightly schizophrenic on this one and uh, I have to say it's a difficult call every, every single year and I'm still not decided on where I'll be this year. But uh, it's a pleasure to be able to back two teams, particularly in the Six Nations. Bernard Mongan has been in the Guards for almost three years. He was born and reared in England. He's a member of the travelling community. As his family moved from city to city in Britain, the people he met and mixed with were Irish. I grew, I grew up in a caravan, basically. I, it was only me and my sister when we were small. And uh, then when I, was, when I was seven, we, uh, we had another baby, and, uh, which was a girl. Another two years after that, we had another girl. And uh, then um, when I was about 14, oh, sorry, 12 or 14, 12 or 13, we, uh, we actually moved into the house for the first time. But um, before that, we were traveling up and down England. So, which is, well, I, I've lived in England all my life. I was born here. But um, growing up in that community, because because uh, everyone else is from Ireland, you, you, only, you only mix with each other. I with each other. So, um, so that's why I've got an Irish accent now. I love the army because it gives you so many opportunities to travel. Like I've, um, I've, been, I've been out to the South American jungle in Belize. I've also, I've also been to Canada as well. So, and that was, that was great. I want to go out to Afghan with my regiment. I plan on staying in for another few years. During the Troubles, the flow of applicants from the Republic slowed down. Many Irishmen who were in the Guards became cautious about returning home. After Bloody Sunday, when British paratroopers killed 14 civilians in Derry, tensions increased. Three weeks later, near where the Irish Guards are now based in Aldershot, the official IRA planted a bomb at the Paris headquarters. 
It was the first major bomb attack of the Troubles on the British mainland, but the intended victims were abroad on duty. Seven people were killed, an elderly gardener, five kitchen staff and a Catholic chaplain. In 1981, the Irish Guards themselves were the target of an IRA attack at Chelsea Barracks, when a nail bomb explosion killed two civilians and injured two soldiers. Last month in Belfast, the Irish Guards and other units of the British Armed Forces were at the centre of a political storm. A homecoming parade for those who had served in Iraq and Afghanistan brought different factions and different views to the streets. Did you ever feel frustrated by the fact how that maybe in Ireland there were people who saw you as a member of the British Army, whereas if you went into a pub here and your Dublin accent came out, this is oh, there's another bloody Irishman. So did you ever feel that you weren't fully committed to either England or Ireland? Um, no, um, to be honest, uh, you know, I've heard stories and we've all probably read stories about, about that type of thing going on, but um, I've never been, personally, that's never affected me. Um, and, you, you know, as far as I'm concerned, as I explained earlier on, uh, I joined the army to be a soldier. Um, I'm not really, I'm not, you know, I don't like delve into it or I don't get myself too involved in the political aspects of it. Um, I'm an Irishman and I always will be an Irishman, um, you know, albeit I'm, I'm serving in the British Army as part of an Irish regiment. And that's the way I look upon it. Um, you know, I, 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 I treat, um, and I think everybody should be treated, treated equally, um, you know, rightly or wrongly. But um, the, there's clearly a line to go down whether you're dealing with somebody in, in Iraq, Afghanistan or in Northern Ireland. Um, and, you know, it, it's a job to me and it's a job that I've fulfilled for, for 22 years and, and, and I'll continue to do so. Soldiers are permanently training for dangerous situations. Conflict often involves the stark choice of kill or be killed. Soldiering regularly means being in a place where you're regarded as an invader, an oppressor, an enemy. The guards served in Iraq in 2003 and again last year. During that invasion of Iraq five years ago, the regiment was the first to enter Basra. Two of its soldiers were killed during that time, a piper from Zimbabwe and a 28-year-old Dubliner, Lance Corporal Ian Malone. We lost uh, four Irish guardsmen in Iraq, uh, two in 2003 uh, and two soldiers last year. All immensely professional men who had been prepared to put themselves in harm's way on all of our behalf, all of our behalf. And of course, whilst they're dedicated, we accept that this is a risk of our profession, but they're never forgotten. And everybody in the regiment remembers them, remembers them fondly, and remembers their dedication and service and their commitment. And it has a profound effect on all of us, but I think we all recognize their contribution and we all understand fully that our job is to get on with the mission we're given and continue soldiering and they would want for nothing else. Last year the regiment was back in Iraq. Once it was never far away. This is the Basra bucket. Uh, and when we were uh, on operations in southern Iraq last year, uh, we, all our stores were in the, these sea containers. Um, and what happened one particular morning, uh, an indirect fire rocket came in, a 120 uh, pounder came in and blew the containers to pieces. And this is one of the uh, items that was in the, uh, in the container. And as you can see, you know, from the velocity, it's, uh, it's really give us, uh, give us a bit of a shake up. All the windows sort of shook. Um, and uh, this was the result. Uh, the containers went on fire. A lot of the equipment was damaged, just landed about 20 metres away from where we were. But this was a regular occurrence, this sort of activity. And we're going to put a nice uh, plant in this eventually. Um, and, uh, keep it outside uh, the department as a little memento of our time when we got uh, a rocket attack that particular day. Every day, mortars. There's so many ways you, can, you could lose your life, like mortars, you'd be shot at, doing patrols on the streets and stuff like that. Like, I mean... I'd be a fool to say I wasn't afraid sometimes, but, you know what I mean, we, we got through it, all the lads, we all stuck together and obviously that's how we came to get back here and, and it was a good tour, like. Yeah, this is, this is a bit of uh, booty which we, uh, we uh, sort of gathered up uh, during our tour of Iraq in 2003 
of uh, Saddam on the phone, which you'll just note, he's got a bit of an uh, Irish Guards regimental insignia on, which is the blue, red, blue, the colours of the royal household, which is the same colour that I'm wearing on my sleeve. At present, the Irish Guards are in between what they call tours of duty. Early next year, they'll switch base to Windsor. They'll have a period of public duties at Windsor Castle, wearing their distinctive scarlet tunics and bearskin hats, while the cameras click and Britain benefits from considerable tourist revenue. Every Irish guardsman, either be an officer, warrant officer, senior non-commissioned officer or a guardsman, will have a tunic. And what we have is a number of tunics that are specially made to suit that individual's requirements. Here, what you can see is we've got the officer's tunics, and the officer's tunics come with gold braid with the shamrock. And what we have is we have the harp and the crown, we step back to the famous Irish regiments going back to the time of the Boer War. But we also can see that the buttons are situated in fours, which means to us that we're the fourth regiment of foot guards, which are the Irish guards, uh, for whenever we were formed back in 1900. Uh, uh, go to the officers, but nevertheless, um, the warrant officers will have their tunics, um, they will have a set of treads, and they will have their great coats. And what you can see is that we have the star, um, the Irish Guard star, superimposed is the shamrock, and the shamrock is on top of the cross of St. Patrick. And uh, you can see that uh, we have our crowns placed onto the shamrock to keep our Irishness within our uniforms and to continue the fine tradition that we have uh, from the island of Ireland. The regiment's master tailor is a corkman, Sergeant Niall Sheehan. It's his job to prepare the tunics for each member of the regiment. Back in! Back in! Back in! 800! 800! A roll recruit earns around £13,000 a year. With no promotion, after nine years that will increase to £23,000. The sergeant with similar service earns £33,000. The maximum time one can stay in the army is 24 years. Um, two years time, that'll be me actually. I think I'll finish up. Uh, my family's uh, got a lot older now and I want to spend a bit more time with them. Where will you live? Will you go back to Ireland or will you live here? No, no, I've, um, I will use the, I'll move to warmer climates, I think. Really? Really, yes. Where will you go to? Uh, Spain. The minute times are good, like, like, I get paid quite well and I enjoy myself, so I can't see any reason to get out of them in the minute. Could you see yourself putting down roots here rather than in Ireland? Oh, still, back home is the place to be, like, I love going and leaving that, like, I won't lie. All oh, my mates are back there as well, like, so any chance I get, like, any long leave I get, I go straight back. I don't know, I'd say I'll definitely go back, like, definitely, like, all the family and all that, like, it's where I'm born, where I'm from, so I'd say the roots are back home still, like. Most people say open a bar, but no, I think I'll just um, either drive a truck or a taxi. I just basically want something uh, nine to five, really, and an opportunity to uh, spend more time with my family. Will you learn Spanish or have you been learning it already? I have actually, you know. Uh, I have actually learned some Spanish. Uh, my wife is Spanish, which helps. Um, so I have learned some Spanish, you know. You know. On a cerveza por favor. That's all. That's all you need to know. <laughs> Regimental Quartermaster Sergeant and Regimental Careers Management Warrant Officer, Tell it! Quick march! For a select few, after the maximum 24 years service, there is one way to remain in the army until the age of 55. That involves breaking through the promotional glass ceiling and becoming a commissioned officer. On the second and final day of our visit to Aldershot, something unusual happened. Three men were about to receive what for them would be great news, and we were there to record it. Thank you, Regiment Sergeant Major. I mean, I think, Sam Major, if you, if you would fall in on, on the end there, because I, I wanted to uh, be the very first person to congratulate all three of you having been selected for a commission in the Irish Guards. And uh, it's just a huge, huge moment in your lives and an absolutely ringing endorsement of 
of the 20 plus years each one of you served in the British Army. Very, very many congratulations and really sincerely heartfelt and uh, we much look forward to having you as officers in the Irish Guards. Great, who'd like a drink as well? As Dubliner, Pierce Lally and his colleagues were preparing to celebrate the news of their promotion, a section of the Guards was returning from an arduous 24-hour training stint. Uh, it was only up for the night there. It was just a training exercise, you know. But uh, we're going out this Monday for uh, two weeks. But uh, we just, last night we were in an OP. Just had to dig all night, really. Set up an OP, get comfortable, and then... What's an OP? It's an observation post where you just dig in and then just spy on the enemy and without being seen, hopefully, and that was it. You know? So we succeeded last night anyway, so it was quite good, you know. So where are you from with an accent like that? I'm a uh, Dublin man. So, joined up uh, three years ago now. So I'm enjoying it now, you know. Done a tour of Iraq, been to Belize, gone to Kenya next year. Afghanistan's coming up. So, quite good, you know. What sort of a life is it? Busy. But it's a good life, you know. It's great, uh, just, it's great comebacks as well like, for like, adventure training and that, like, you know. And there's no problem, like, if you have, you know, if you need to get home or anything like that, just the Italian are always Irish oriented so they'll send you home if you need to get home they'll help you out you know it's good life you know it's good hierarchy here they look after you not like you know Had you any difficulty about being part of the British Army? Eh uh, nothing's being said as yet you know nobody I don't think not many people know until now I'd say you know but erm um, yes not, nobody said anything like you know just keep myself to myself when I go home I've got a family and that now so that's all you have to do, you know. You still get the bar still talkers. You know, and that's about it, you know. But there's a huge Irish tradition here, isn't there? A lot to be proud of. Ah, yeah. Um, well, I've got over 100 years in the British Army, in my family. Uh, since the 1880s. We've served in numerous battalions, like, all over the world. First World War, Second World War. And then, uh, 1950s. And myself. So it's always been there, you know. For 70% of the British Army in the 1800s, or 1900s, sorry, was Irish. So there's still a good few Irish here, like, an awful lot, you know. Do you think it's going to be a career for you? you think it'll stay a few years? No, no, I'm just going to do uh, Afghanistan and go home. You know, it's a different army to what it is back home, you know, Defence Force and that, like, but I just wanted, I just wanted to come back and do Iraq and Afghanistan. That's me, I'll go home to my family. And what will you do then? What sort of a career do you see for yourself after your, your life here? If I can do this for a few years, I reckon I could do anything when I get out of the city street, you know. I'm be shy of picking a shovel again, it's all, you know. As well as the Irish accents and Irish-born personnel, evidence of the regiment's links with Ireland is dotted around the Aldershot base. There's a tradition of officers carrying blackthorn sticks. The regimental mascot, an Irish wolfhound, is always named after an Irish high king. The first mascot was called Brian Brew. The current one, Con Mail, came from kennels in County Tipperary. The most recent recruitment patterns suggest that young Irishmen from south and north continue to apply for a career soldiering with this unique battalion of the British Army. A lock! A lot. Lock! Lock! Weapons fired! Weapons fired! Weapons stop! Stop it! Stop it! As the recession bites, despite the dangers and the controversial nature of the work, that tradition seems likely to continue. A tradition there that has endured for more than 200 years and looks set to continue for as long as young men and now young women feel the urge to join the army of our nearest neighbour. Well, that ends our programme for this evening. We'll be back with you on Wednesday. Agus Gadishin on the Hainyo Vurin, Agus on Galafurt in On Lera, Iwahagwif. And on next Wednesday's programme, uncovering the mystery of the Boyne boot, taken up from beneath the mud of the River Boyne after hundreds of years. 
preserving the traditional craft of the boat builder and the tome which records the history of Irish boats, and treasure hunt and the divers still searching for the gold bullion in the ship which went to the bottom of the sea at Loch Swilly nearly a century ago.